want to call the order of Bloomfield Hills Board of Education special meeting, January 7th, 2021, 6 o'clock. Lisa, you take attendance. All board members are present. Okay. Um, before we go into uh, general discussion, I want to officially, on behalf of the community, uh, district, and board, welcome our three new board members, mm -hmm. Michelle, Jonathan, and Siva, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them. Michelle, um, for, this is for our current board members and the community. Michelle is a director of academic advising and student services for the School of Health Sciences at Oakland University. With nearly 20 years of experience in higher education, Michelle's professional experience includes, but are not limited to, the areas of strategic planning, diversity, equity, inclusion, training, development, and retention. Michelle is currently completing a PhD in education and holds a Master of Arts degree in counseling as well as an MSA degree in administration. Michelle and her husband have lived in the district for many years with their four children. Jonathan currently holds a Juris Doctorate from the University of Detroit Mercy and has practiced law for the last 13 years. Jonathan also holds a BA in Economics and Management from Albion College and has worked as a case evaluator for the Wayne County Mediation Tribunal. Jonathan is married with three children, two currently enrolled in BHS and one who will enroll in the fall of 2021. Siva is the senior director at DWH Corp, a financial and business consulting firm. Siva has over 30 years of experience in finance, business development, and operations. Siva holds an MBA from the Roth School of Business at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a master's degree in engineering from Wayne State University. Siva also earned an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. Siva and his wife had two college students who graduated from Bloomfield Hill Schools. So on behalf of the board and community, Michelle, Jonathan, Siva, welcome to the Bloomfield Hill School Board. Thank you. With that, we will go. To, we will go to general discussion. The board officer discussions, intentions, nominations. So, with that, what we will do is we will go in order: as president, vice president, treasurer, secretary. For anyone who wants to nominate someone to be an officer, or anyone who has intent officer. So now I will open it up um, for president. Anyone want to make a nomination? Howard. I would like to nominate Paul Cohen. Um, I'd like to accept your nomination. Thank you, Howard. Anyone else? Jennifer? I'd like to nominate Lisa Efros. Lisa, would you like to accept the nomination? I accept, thank you. Anyone else for president? Okay, with that, we will go to vice president. Lisa? I nominate Jennifer Cook. Jennifer, would you like to accept the nomination? I accept. Thank you. Anyone else? Nominate or anyone else have intention for vice president? I'd like to nominate myself, please. Okay. Howard Barron, vice president. Anyone else? We will go to treasurer. Anyone would like to nominate someone for treasurer? Lisa? I nominate Michelle Southward. Michelle, would you like to accept the nomination as treasurer? I accept the nomination. Okay. Anyone else? Treasurer? I would like to nominate myself also for that position. I was just going to do that, Howard. Oh, <laughs> thank you, my dear. I nominate him, too. OK, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> Treasurer, anyone, el uh, anyone else? Secretary? I'd like to nominate um, Lisa Afros. Lisa, would you like to accept? Nomination no, secretary? thank you, Howard. I do not want to accept. I'd like to nominate John Van Gimmerit. John, would you like to accept? I'll accept. Okay, John for secretary. Any other nominations? Okay, with that, um, I'd like to have discussion regarding the nominations. We will go in order 
um, starting with the experienced board members, alphabetical order. Going first will be Howard. Okay. Um, I put myself in for two positions uh, because I know that Michelle has got some interest in treasure. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm interested in being an officer is uh, there are a number of uh, financial issues which I think need to be looked at very seriously by our, our organization. Now, again, this would be purely at the, at the discretion of the board to uh, delegate or assign me some uh, um, responsibilities of looking at these things. Because the way our, our uh, officers have worked in the past, our officers really have not uh, done as much as other boards have done or other at officers that other boards have done. So uh, I definitely would um, only do things if they if the board so delegated these assignments to me. But some of the things that I think that could be uh, very useful for this organization are the following. Um, we currently get some monthly financial reports from our CFO, Tina Kostick, and um, they are not as useful, I believe, as they could be. So I think they need a little bit of, uh, of looking at. Uh, so I would like to uh, work with the CFO and uh, review what they are, talk to the board, see how they use the financial reports, and see whether we can make some improvements to them. Uh, the second thing is um, our annual budget budgeting process. Um, we only look at the uh, budget in a total, meaning our total expenditures, which is approximately a, about $100 million a year. Uh, but we really don't get any of the detail that supports it, uh, even, even to the level, to the extent of just one level down at the buildings, building level. So what I'd like to do is look at the, uh, the budgeting process and see whether our budgets uh, by building can reflect the equity that we all are desiring, I hope we're desiring, to uh, look at the needs of the children and the amount of money that we spend in each one of the buildings and see whether those two are matching at a, at a building level. So that's a, a second initiative I'd like to look at. The third is we uh, were very, very uh, pleased that the community granted us uh, about a $200 million bond in August of 2020. Uh, we have now as a board a great responsibility to make sure that money is spent wisely and that we keep the, uh, the spending on time and within budget. Um, I've already started uh, through the FFLA committee to talk to Barton Mallow at some of the um, spending reports that they have available. When I worked uh, in my career before I retired 10 years ago, I've been doing uh, capital budgeting and capital uh, spending forecasting for 30 years. So I uh, uh, looked at the reports that they gave us, and while they are good, I think they possibly could be better. So I would like to uh, look at those also. Uh, and again, all of these would be at the discretion of the board to give me that assignment. And if so, I would work with the, the CFO and, and Barton Mallow. And if um, we could make some improvements, I would bring it back through the organization, through FFLA, and then back to the board to get the uh, final approval of any changes that uh, you guys might want to make. So those are the things, uh, the initiatives and the goals that I'd like to have for 2021 um, if I were uh, granted the ability to be either uh, uh, vice president, which currently the only responsibility of generally, other than just backing up the president, is handling um, the superintendent evaluation. And that also might change when we go to the new ED model. So I think this would definitely be a, uh, a, a benefit for the, the board as a whole and the organization if we could make some of these uh, financial improvements. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Uh, Jennifer? Hi there. Yeah, so um, I put myself in as vice president simply because um, I'm the only one of the four non-new board members who has, has yet to serve in an officer position. And I feel ready to take on uh, this time commitment, which as Howard just said, is not huge. 
um, because I, I have a lot of other obligations, but these positions are supposed to rotate in order to gain experience and maturity of each board member. So at this time, I feel ready to take on the responsibility of one of the officer positions, and I think I would do a good job. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Lisa? Thanks, Jennifer. That was very well said, and um, I echo that sentiment. It's, I think the intent and healthy for the organization to rotate officer positions. Uh, I uh, the the two candidates that I nominated would be new to the position, um, but I have a lot of confidence in both of them that they could do an excellent job. I would uh, myself be new to the position of president. I think it's time to rotate. I think that, um, again, it's good practice. It's healthy for the organization. And I feel ready to bring the governance team um, together. So I feel like I'm up to the task. Thanks, Lisa. OK, I, I have a statement I'd like to read. Um, so uh, to the death, I just want to read the definition of a Bloomfield Hill School Board member. So we are locally elected public officials entrusted with governing Bloomfield Hills Public Schools. The role of the school board is to ensure the Bloomfield Hills School District is responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of our community. Having had the honor of being elected to your board president for the last two years, I would like to be reelected as president for 2021 for the following reasons. I pride myself as someone who collaborates, listens, and compromises, while at the same time proactively gets things done. These traits permit me to fulfill the role as your board president as a job which requires the following. To have regular and frequent discussions with all board members in order to hear input on what is important to each and every one of you. To work and execute our agreed upon board goals. To provide opportunities that best fit each and everyone's strengths. To monitor our district goals on a yearly basis and to ensure our strategic plan is being executed. During his first year at Bloomfield Hills, Superintendent Pat Watson along with his assistant Rebecca will validate that the three of us have a great working relationship. And as I indicated, it's only been one year working with new superintendent, Pat Watson. In the last six years, while being on the school board and two years as president, I've also built a strong bond with the teachers union, which endorsed me during my reelection race in 2018, along with a great relationship with their current and past president and their executive board. I believe that I have built a high degree of trust with the BHEA. In addition, I've spent a significant amount of time during those six years engaging with the community and developing their trust as a leader of our district. I was recognized and awarded by the district's parent teacher organization, the PTOC, as a community contributor. Equity is also one of the cornerstones of our district's values. I have spent the last six years going to various training seminars, which included a two-day seminar on healing racism, along with multiple trainings to become a Bloomfield Hills Master Global Champion. I helped to start our student intern program and assisted in the creation of the Student Equity Council. I sit on the board of Bloomfield Birmingham Community Coalition and Bloomfield Youth Assistance. I'm also the chair of the Bloomfield Youth Assistance Recognition and Enrichment Committees. Over the past two years, Bloomfield Hill School District has accomplished a great deal while I was president. With the community, we created and approved a new district strategic plan. We hired a new superintendent. We passed a historic $200 million bond for 13 of our school properties. We created a new student intern program, provided student voice to Student Equity Council, and the student equity resolution. Updated our board policies, including initiating the creation of board operating procedures. Started the conversation of a new board committee governance structure. Navigated through this pandemic with a new virtual academy and provided everyone a choice for learning. All of us working as a team of eight have many things to accomplish also in this upcoming year. Lower some of the tasks to be addressed in 2021 as a team of eight. Strategic plan completion with goals and measurables developed as a team of eight working on developing the best governance structure that max maximizes the abilities of the team of eight to operate effectively with Pat Watson's team, oversight on the bond to ensure completion on time and on budget, continue to work on board policies, board operating procedures to ensure good governance, continue to focus on student achievement, student mental health of our students during COVID and hopefully post COVID, onboarding our new board members, continually to provide education opportunities for our new board members, cultural discussion so that the team of eight works effectively, both as a team with Pat and his team. With over 40% turnover in our board starting in January, having similar leadership is critical at this time and even more important. And I look forward to an exciting and impactful upcoming year. I ask for your vote for the 2021 president of the Bloomfield Hill School Board. 
We'll go now to Jonathan. Good evening. Um, I didn't anticipate being nominated for a position today. However, it seems as though no one else was nominated for the secretary position. And as your loyal servant, I will faithfully uh, accept the position if uh, if I get the votes. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Michelle. I uh, thank you um, for the nomination. I do appreciate uh, having an opportunity to serve with the eight of you. Uh, I believe in being intentional. And so in, in my drive today to lead you as your treasurer, um, I've had the opportunity to already participate in several Michigan Association of School Board uh, uh, officials trainings in the area of finance. And so I think it's important not just for us to focus on the bond at hand, but the other finances that represent the rest of our district. And so I, I want to work in concert uh, with our team of officials that we have already elected, or should I say that we already have in place and using their level of expertise to, um, to work together to make sure we stay informed, and remain transparent as a district and allowing our, our communities to know what we're doing with their dollars. And so I do believe that we have the, the level of experience that we have on our district uh, to work together uh, and I'm looking forward to being your treasurer and making sure that we know not just what we're doing, but we work together and ensuring that when we spend each uh, each dollar that it goes toward um, the needs of our, our, our district in the most effective way and that we have conversations together to, to work as a unit as opposed to uh, any negative conversations that we can have about what we are and are not able to do. And so I believe that myself as a um, as a leader uh, and working uh, to build people. Uh, if there are areas that we have that we need to grow in our financial reporting, that we work together to find a way in which we can um, uh, be able to report things out as best received by individuals receiving those reports. And so I'm looking forward to working with our CFO and ensuring that uh, we together are able to represent um, our district and uh, what we are looking to do as a board member, we are not necessarily here to, uh, uh, to to spend the money, but to help decide on how um, that money is divided. And so I'm looking forward to serving you as your treasurer, and I thank you for your time. Thanks, Michelle. Siva? Who was that, Paul? I chose not to run, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Just, you know, in, in, if you have any comments, you don't have any comments. No, no, no comments. No comments. I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, electing the candidates. Uh, I think we've got a great uh, a roster here of, of candidates. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Sid. Well, with that, um, we'll close this and we'll go now to uh, Superintendent Watson for the COVID data update. Paul, Paul, could you just indicate, I don't know if you did it earlier, exactly what is the next step in this process? The next step is next week at our board meeting on the 14th, um, we will, as a team of seven, our board members will vote in for each of the positions um, as we've been nominated in tension tonight. And uh, you'll get more, you know, more details closer to the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. With that, Superintendent Watson, COVID update. Uh, thank you, President Colin, and Happy New Year, everyone. And Michelle and Siva and John, welcome to the board and thank you for being here. So as it loads up, so as we do at every meeting now, we'll have our COVID update. There's quite a bit of information and some new things that I'll share as we go through. Next slide, please. So one of the good things that happened just yesterday is that the Oakland County Health Division opened the COVID-19 vaccine registrator for educators in the county. And it's just not educators that are in this group. You know, it's going to be those that are 65 and older and other people as well. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, while that's great news and we're excited, 75% of all the vaccines for this group are mandated by the state of Michigan to go to those 65 and older. That leaves 25% of the remaining vaccines to go to everyone else in the group. So please keep that in mind. I know based on talking to Oakland County Health Division today, it's gonna to take them a little bit of time to ramp up. 
Um, by about midnight last night, they were able to register the max amount of people they could within this group. Uh, they also shared that they're not going to be able to prioritize a group. So it's not going to be one district over another. Uh, the only priority, uh, only group that's kind of being prioritized because of the state mandate, again, is going to be those that are 65 and older. So we did email instructions to our staff yesterday evening. I talked to quite a few staff members today that were able to sign up. Uh, there were a couple of glitches along the way where people got phone calls back saying, well, you're signed up for this day and this is the second day, but it needs to be X amount of days between the dose, so we'll need to find you a new day for that. And so the first dose appointments are available in the coming weeks, and it actually looks like uh, we have staff members that are going for the first shot on Monday. So as Moderna vaccine comes online, as more Pfizer vaccines come in, it is really, really hopeful news and great news um, that we have this opportunity. Next slide. So looking at the last reporting period, which is December 23rd to January 5th, a couple things to look uh, to, to notice. We do see some of the age groups going up, but it is a slight uptick overall. For example, there are 222 uh, cases total or 222 total, uh, 220 case increase compared to the last uh, update that we had, which would have come over break. Uh, still seeing a lot of that 19 to 20 age group or 19 to 29 age group, that remains the highest group. And that's been pretty consistent for the past four to five months. Next slide. Uh, capacity as far as hospital, uh, hospital capacity, still stable. We're starting to see the numbers start to decrease in those areas. Again, this is just looking at the state hospitalization trend. We're not looking at what's going on nationally. It's different by region, by state, obviously. Uh, but in Michigan, we're in pretty good shape right now. Next slide. As a nation, we are still seeing a big increase. We know that there's different strands. We've all watched the news and know what's going on in the United Kingdom. Um, those strands have been identified in some parts of the United States. Um, again, overall, the United States is going up again. However, in the state of Michigan, we're quite a bit lower than we were, um, especially after that huge spike right before Thanksgiving and after Thanksgiving time. Next slide. Looking at our case rate, you can see the case rate is dropped back down into the orange area. We've been about 15 days there with a three-day lag. For a percent positive, we dropped back down in the orange as well. And it looks like we've been there about the same amount of time. Next slide. Again, looking at the Oakland County average, looking at a different data table, which is sometimes easier for people to see. You can see we had that huge spike in November. It's been trending down. You can also see the cases per day at the top right. You know, looking at yesterday at 196. One thing you're going to start to see on the Oakland County Health Division website is they're starting to account for the lag as well. So although you see 196 for yesterday, if you check each day, there's a good chance that it is going to go up so they can capture the tests that come in later. Next slide. Uh, we were one of the first districts uh, in the United States to sign up to be part of the Brown University and School Superintendents and Principals Association dashboard. Uh, and, and the goal is to report our data so we have an idea whether or not transmission is taking place in school. We do know that transmission does take place in schools. Um, we know that for a fact. Uh, what the data currently suggests, though, is that it's at a much lower rate than what you see as far as community spread. So you look at the students enrolled over 36, uh, uh, enrollments over 36 million, that is divided by staff, students in person, students online. Uh, so that's something we'll keep sending our data to and keep track of as well. And I believe this was mentioned in one of the CNN reports um, over the winter break where they talked about schools and transmission and what is taking place on a national level. Next slide. Thanks, Pat. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? I'll look to see. I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, Howard? Uh, 
Howard, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, David, could you go back to the county dashboard? I think it was page six. That one, yep, yep. Uh, go forward by one. There we go, okay. So, um, Pat, our percent positivity um, is going up. Now it's right in the top of the orange, you know, very close to the, the red. Um, I think it's at 9%, am I right? Seven day moving average. I'd have to be in the, or on the website and toggle over to find what it is. All right, all right. So uh, using the, the weekly sheet that we got from Oakland County, it has yeah, it's a, nine, it has nine 9.02 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, again, the, 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 the presentation we had that you gave us yesterday was as of you know, Christmas time. And this has got a, a few extra, uh, you know, some extra updated uh, detail here. So um, we're on an upward trend. We're at nine. We're close to the top of the uh, of the orange, um, and then we've got Christmas vacations and and New Year's Eve that will hit us. So if we make a decision, because right now we're in orange, and if we make a decision tonight that we're in because we're in orange, and then the middle of next week we cross that red into that red threshold what happens nothing happens before winter break we approved how we're going to apply our metrics a little differently and we had a conversation about that so nothing would happen we'll continue with our mitigation strategies and our best practices as we have in fact you know before you've asked you know has harvard updated the metrics you know we don't know dr ja left and went on to Brown University. Uh, they were updated on the 28th, and there's some information out there that may be updated again tomorrow. But either way, as part of my board update that is coming your way tomorrow, the recommendation no longer is to have a complete shutdown if you move to those thresholds. Kind of like I shared before break, when you approved how we're going to apply our metrics a little differently, that's not best practice. It needs to be targeted. Uh, the examples I've used is looking at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. When they close things, it's not we're shutting everything down. Well, restaurants are going to be open. High schools might be closed, but K through eight can be open. Making decisions decisions based on data. So when would I guess the next question is, when will we move back to distance? If we can't staff a building, we would need to move back to distance. If the Oakland County Health Division comes in and says, you know what? You've got spread in that classroom, close that classroom for four days, 14 days, 10 days, absolutely. Oakland County Health Division comes in and says, you have spread in your building, whatever building. You need to close that building. Everyone then goes to distance learning. You need to do that for 14 days. That is what best practice is now. We see that in the state of Michigan, we see it nationally, and we see our international partners doing the same thing. And I believe that's why Dr. Ja and his team now collaborating with Brown and Harvard medical professionals remove that. He goes on to say that in the summer, they didn't really know what spread was going to be like during the school year. They weren't sure what the mitigation factors were going to be or if they were even going to work. Now that the data supports that they do work, they do not support just a, a full closure because you've reached that artificial number. And so we did approve that at our last board meeting of how we're going to apply the metrics moving forward. So if we reach the red, we still need to be diligent. We need to wear a mask. We need to wash our hands. We need to do the things we've been doing. We need to be smart about it. But it would not necessitate us having a board meeting to move to remote learning. Well, um, all right. So let's, uh, I will wait until we get to the leading indicators slide, which is what we talked about in, um, in December. And then I will ask some more questions. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Jennifer. Yeah, can I, I just want to speak to the positivity metric, um, Howard, and, and everybody. So it, it's a it's a great statistic, 
but we have to have an understanding of how it's evolved in, in the beginning of COVID. And so what it is the number of people test of those who are tested, what percentage are testing positive. So in the beginning of COVID, when testing was, you know, everybody was catch as catch can because everyone was worried and wanted to get tested, the percent positivity statistic was mirroring an incidence statistic. In other words, of the population in general, how many are positive. Now that we're more evolved and we've lived with this thing for a while, it is the case that the people who tend to get tested are the people who are either, you know, moving in and out in contact with a vulnerable population, like elderly relatives, um, or the people who are who do have sick symptoms of sickness, okay? So the, the percentage, the people who are being tested is a more targeted population. And so the percentage of those people who are positive, we can expect to go up, okay? So, so there's a subtlety here because of the math and because of the population dynamics, we're just looking at that one number going up or down is, is not necessarily reflective of either incidents or, you know, most importantly, in my opinion, virulence. So, so just to put it in perspective. Thanks, Jennifer. Any other questions or comments? Then we'll go on. Uh, Superintendent Watson to a staffing update. Thank you, President Nicole. So staff and update, next slide, please, David. Right now we have 176 recovered or returned staff members. We have nine staff that are on active EPSLA. We have two that are currently quarantined. We have 18 active FMLA. Again, plus the unknown of those who may not have told us since we are in distance learning a remote status. Uh, a couple of good things with this, um, some positives. I know talking to Jane Mack, she actually has some interviews for bus drivers. And I was really excited about that. And so that, that is a definitely a positive. I've also had a few substitute teachers who were not willing to work this year that have reached out to me and shared that if they're able to get the vaccine, they're more than willing to come and be part of the sub pool again. And also over break had the opportunity to talk to some people at the collegiate level and they are sharing with their students that if you have 60 credit hours and you're home and you live in Oakland County and you have Tuesdays and Thursdays where you don't have classes until the evening, you can sub and get some experience whether you're an education major or not. That would be a great opportunity to make some additional funds there. So we continue to market and promote that and are excited that potentially we're going to have more subs available. Next slide. Again, as a reminder, we increased the daily rate from 105 to $130. Uh, dollars. I understand it's not the highest amount total, uh, but the opportunity to hang out with kids and be in the building with them is priceless. They definitely are our future. I know talking to Paul, who's a student who's on the call today, just being able to engage with him and talk to him was amazing uh, to hear what he's thinking about as far as moving forward. And so right now, compared to last year, we've got 30 fewer total new substitute teachers, parents, and instructional assistants. So still some difficulty there. Again, the optimism is those who receive a vaccine are going to be more willing to come back and be in the building. Next slide, please. Thanks, uh, Pat. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, if you'd wanna just close up the uh, presentation so I could see uh, my colleagues, see if anyone has any questions or comments. Oh, I, I just have a uh, quick answer. Question okay. about staffing, and th this this is probably impossible to answer, but because we are in a different place now than early November with the vaccine becoming available, um, but so for example, how we had to go to all remote with high school because of staffing, um, even before the the disease numbers had gone way up, um, are are you concerned about that? Um, do you? Do you, are you worried that that could happen again or um, sort of what's, what, what are you thinking about our status? I am worried that, that it could happen again. Um, 
we don't know how many people might wake up in the morning and not be able to pass the screener, right? But we know we have as many mitigation, you know, things in place as possible. We've done all we can. And the students are returned, ready to return to school, right? The students that have reached out to me, they that want to be, again, everyone has a, you know, different path of what they want to do. And we respect that, we understand that. But they want to be back in the building. They're really anxious to be back. And if we have to go distance again because we can't staff the building, then that's what we have to do. And, you know, I think we have a very educated community that understands like, okay, I get that. I understand that, right? Every effort was made and we can't staff it. The other thing I'm waiting to hear, and I've got a call in someone in a different state, we know as of right this minute, and it could change, if you receive both doses of the vaccine, and you come into close contact with someone who is COVID-19 positive, you still might need to quarantine, right? So we know that. That might change, right. but no one's sure, because things keep changing. Just like we, we change the way we're applying our metrics because we know more. This is going to continue to evolve as time goes on. In the meantime, it's time to move forward. It's, it, it's, it is. Totally agree. Uh, I don't see any other hands up, anything in the chat. So we will go to return to in-person learning presentation. All right, thank you. So return to hybrid in-person learning. Next slide. So just kind of, we will be returning if approved to where we left off. So special education schedules vary by program. Grace kindergarten through eight will divide the day between AM and PM cohorts. Grades nine through 12 will have full, full day group A, Monday and Tuesday, group B, Thursday and Friday, in-person schedules. Blumen preschool will resume as well. So it is the same format and system that we left when we went distance back in November. Next slide. So the proposals for January 19th to bring back early on, SEED, Blooming Preschool, all students in K through eight, including ARP and FRP K through eight, Wing Lake, grades pre-K through eight, deaf and hard of hearing, Bowers Academy, Prep, and Blackhawk Extended Care. On January 25th, the plan is to bring back the International Academy. The reason for International Academy on the 25th is that is the start of their second semester. BHHS, or all Bloomfield Hills High School students, including ARP and FRP, grades 9 through 12, deaf and hard of hearing, will come back February 1st. And so probably the first question that I would have is, why is IA coming back before BHHS? As I mentioned before, on January, January 25th, that is the start of second semester for IA. At BHHS, January 25th, and that week is the week of finals. Finals are scheduled for a half day. They're also scheduled to be online, so there's equitable opportunity for all students for their final experience. Additionally, based on our middle school and elementary school, knowing that the high school is having half days during that time, we wouldn't be able to provide transportation. 2-1 or February 1st is also the start of second semester for BHHS. So that is the rationale. Why January 19th? for the rest of the groups, we told the community we would give everyone transition time um, as much as we possibly could. And we know also for a lot of our staff members, they'll need to line up daycare and things for their own children so that they're able to return back to work. I know everyone's anxious. There's no question about it. Uh, I'm working with the team. The goal is to propose dates that we felt were A, doable, and B, as fast as we could to get people back into the buildings, again, as safely as possible. Next slide. So just kind of reviewing where we left off as far as how we're applying our um, metrics a little bit differently. We know we have two leading indicators, number of new cases and percent positive. Again, the vaccine provides a lot of hope. For me personally, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We know that when the numbers are higher, we have less in-person learning. As the numbers improve and go down, 
we can have more in-person learning. So the first question is, well, what is that going to look like? When is that going to be? Those are things that we don't have a magic eight ball that we can look into and have that answer right now. But keep in mind, even if we hit those additional thresholds where it says less in-person, we are bringing people back to the less in-person model. That's the six feet of social distance. That's the half days K through eight. That's the AB rotation at the high school. That is the less in-person learning model as we bring our students back. Next slide, please. Secondary indicators, number of new COVID-19 hospitalizations, students in quarantine, staffing capacity, COVID-like and influenza-like illness. We know those are all there. Again, next question, and we talked about this earlier, when will we go back to distance? What would make us do that? If we can't staff a building, we would need to go back to distance in that building. Students in quarantine, if 85% of the classroom is in quarantine, we'll probably ask that class to go distance. If we have spread in the classroom and working with the Oakland County Health Division, and they say, you need to go back to you know distance, you need to shut that classroom, obviously we do it. If they say we need to close the building and go distance, we do it. So goal number one is to get our students back to in-person learning. Goal number two, is that vaccines come on board, we get our staff vaccinated, we see those numbers come down, that gives us the opportunity to go to more in person. So coming back with our new metrics, the way we're applying them and the way things are structured, we plan to be back in school barring Oakland County Health Division because there's a case in a class or spread in the building or we can't staff that we're back in person for some capacity in some way, one or another, the remainder of the school year. Next slide. High school athletics and activities. Um, we're waiting on some additional guidance from the MHSAA. One of the things that's gonna come up is, well, well, hold on. There are some sports participating. So what is going on with all athletics and activities of following the MHSAA guidance? A couple things. The MHSAA has been working with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The decision was made between the two groups to allow a couple things. One, ski could take place as long as it was outside, the skis outside, and they remain six feet apart. They've allowed the football and volleyball and swim teams to return if you're still competing in the state tournament. These are fall sports. It's varsity level only. And when you talk about football and volleyball, you're talking about only a handful of teams. As part of that, working with the MHSAA and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, part of that agreement is weekly testing rapid tests for all the students involved. That is the basis on which they can come back. All other winter sports have been postponed. They have not started doing anything since November. In the next seven days, there should be additional guidance about high school athletics and activities. Again, we're using the MHSAA guidelines for both our athletics and for our activity groups. And it does look like that new guidance is going to come out. I say in the next seven days, I wouldn't be surprised if it's much sooner than that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go in order, uh, or reverse order this time with any questions that I see, Howard, but we'll have a chance to ask questions or, or not comment. So, um, thanks. I have just a, a couple of things. One, um, uh, and I'm, I think I know, similar to the reasoning for the IA to start earlier or the 25th, um, the reason the high school, Pat, is starting February, is that just because of the semester break as opposed to everyone coming back on the 19th? The semester break, and already the high school has scheduled their finals I won't call them finals week, but their final, uh, I can't think of it right now. Their final experience for the students was scheduled to be online. 
the week of the 25th. So it's equitable for everyone. So we didn't want to bring him back for a week, have a distance for a week, and then bring him back again. That's not that's not good for everyone. And again, I get it. Everyone's anxious to come back. There, there's no question about it. But it is the best, in my opinion, the best way to move forward is to have them back on February 1st, let them finish finals, we're back second semester. It also allows us to come back for that K through eight group. If we are short on subs, we can backfill at those buildings, right? So that gives us more staff if we need to use them there. It kind of spaces it out. Think of the phase that we did earlier in the year. It was really elongated because we needed to worry about transportation and food service and our protocols going to work. We were having conversations, if you remember, are kids even going to wear a mask at the elementary level? And the answer is yes, they are. They're going to wear a mask. We didn't have a lot of issues with students or staff not wanting to wear a mask. So that's why we're able to condense phase in time now. If the high school had finals beforehand, they'd be back on the 25th as well. And then my final question, I'll just combine my final two questions. One, and I know a lot of our community members will ask, you know, if obviously teachers start getting vaccinated and we're going in the right direction, what would be for second semester the plan or what you know what would be the things that would have to happen for us to go back completely full time and then with that even going hybrid now i know some community members or a lot of people had some questions about wednesdays is, is wednesday still an asynchronous day is there any thought about changing that so th those are my two final questions yeah wednesday is still an asynchronous day right so it's going back to the same same schedule that we had before so what and again everyone wants you know to paint that really clear picture like a happens then b happens and c happens then it equals d and we're good to go unfortunately it's not that easy that's not how COVID works let's see where we're at with vaccines let's see where we're at with numbers every time we have a board meeting we're having an update on that i expect Next week, they have another update, hopefully about more vaccines that are available, right? The goal is for Oakland County Health Division to get more and even set it up so that they can do it on Saturday and Sunday. So I think we're going to have to play it by ear. That's why I said, goal number one, let's get people back. Let's get our students back. We have the data that supports it. We have the science that supports it. We've done every mitigation factor we possibly can. That's step one. Step two, once we know how many vaccines are going to be available, again, 75% of whatever Oakland County gets goes to those 65 and older, period. There's no ands, ifs, or buts. Do we have 5% of our staff vaccine? Do we have 20% of our staff vac vaccinated? It's going to really depend. You know, I can't really answer those now. And again, if I'm a community member, that's just more frustration for me. Just tell me what we're going to do and when. This is not how this pandemic works, unfortunately. Okay, um, we'll go in order. Everyone will have an opportunity, unless Michelle, you want to clarify or have a question, Michelle? I'm okay. I'm okay with going in order. <laughs> okay, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple quick questions, Pat, to clarify. Um, we're still adhering to the governor's roadmap um highly high recommendations correct so we're still adhering to six feet masks um uh, trustee approach you are correct we are coming back under the same model where every highly recommended mitigation um factor is included so the okay. six feet the sand you know the hand washing the, you know, social, everything is included coming back as we were before. All right, so you don't um, anticipate then being able to uh, have more students in face-to-face -face than were in face-to-face -face during existing high red before we went all virtual. Is that correct? Because we were adhering to those guidelines at that point um and the spacing would be similar so whatever the hybrid looked like before staff closures and or the governor 
uh, governor's orders forced us to be all virtual. Those it will look the same for those interested in face to face, right? It will. Okay. Um, that my other question is, um, do w w all of the recommendations um, in terms of quarantine or, or what other other whatever other health recommendations there might be from Michigan Department? Um, of Health and Human Services and or Oakland County Health Department, we're going to take those recommendations. We have. We have from day oh, one. Oh, no, no, I know that. Every single thing to a T. Okay. And I know. That, that's where we're at. I, I guess uh, because um, a uh, Jennifer and I sat in last night on, the, on a board um, trustee slash Oakland County Health Department meeting, and we're told that um, quarantining at this point in time was still going to be recommended when there was potential exposure for teachers, um, regardless of whether they've been partially or fully vaccinated. That we're, is correct. Okay, so if that's the recommendation. That. Okay, so we'll not take that recommendation that until we know as something as differently. As yeah, okay. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I just, uh, you've said that like five times. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding it too, because it, it was surprising to hear that. Actually, I, I do understand a little bit more about it now, yeah. but at the time I was surprised. I didn't think that was going to be the case. But. Yeah, my undergrad degree is in history, not microbiology. So I, we will take that advice. We will operate based on what we know. And when the Oakland County Health Division or CDC then says, you know what, if you've had the vaccine, and you come into close, cont close contact and you continue to wear a mask, you don't have to quarantine. We don't know that. That's not what they're saying right now, right? Just like we adopted, what's a quarantine? It's 10 days if you've been exposed and don't have symptoms. Um, if you start to have symptoms, then it's 14, depending on the onset, and we went over that at our last meeting. So that was an update. Again, how we're applying our metrics differently. We know that's best practice. We talked about it, how it's state best practice now, national best practice, internationally best practice, that even referring to the Harvard model, we had conversations where I was asked, why isn't Harvard updated with that? Well, they've updated now. And they said, this is now best practice. You don't just shut everything down. You have targeted closures if the data says you should do that. And so we're not making this up on a whim. We're not trying to say we're smarter than the professionals. We're saying we want to make sure it's safe for all of our staff to come back. Understand, teachers are still stressed about coming back, right? Let's not pretend they're not. I'm personally stressed about it as well, but I also know we're doing it safely. I also know our kids, for many, being at home is not safe for them. I don't care, you know, what community you live in, for some students, it's not safe. Child Protective Services they're down reports 50%. You're not gonna tell me in Oakland County that child abuse is down 50% this year. So for some of our students, they love virtual. Well, all right, so are you just, I, I, I'm ready to be done asking questions, Pat, but I have oh, to sorry, say, I'm well, just for clarification, we wouldn't leave children in an unsafe environment if we knew about it regardless of COVID, would we? Nope, we're all mandatory reporters. So that goes without saying, so thank you for bringing that up. It's just, you know, we all feel for those students. We want to meet our students where they're at, and our students need different things, right? I've talked to a couple of parents today who said, hey, I got two kids at this level. One loves being at home. It's the best thing ever. The other one needs to be back in school. It's just, it's not working. And we have that opportunity for all of our students, which is great. You know, if you're at the high school and you want to vote in, great. If you're in Bloomfield Virtual, that's great. But if you're in person and that's what your child needs, and we can provide a safe environment for your child and a safe environment for our staff. We have to keep our staff safe. It's a win-win. And it is it is difficult. And again, for, for a lot of the community, the hybrid is not the best thing ever. And, and no one's gonna sit here and pretend like it is. But it's a step forward and it's an opportunity to get back to in-person learning. You know, it's dark when you get up in the morning, it's dark when you go to bed. Some of our students are so isolated in their room. That little bit of social contact can be a huge difference for them from a mental health perspective. You know, your basic needs have to be met before you can learn. And part of that is going to be your mental health. You'll hear me talk about that a lot. It's really, really important. 
I, I appreciate all that and, and the um, the conscientious uh, efforts made to, you know, to try to mitigate as much of the isolation as we can that safely do. So I do appreciate that. From a teacher perspective, uh, uh, you know, we're just over 24 hours from the governor's announcement of stepped up phasing for teachers. Do you have any sense of uh, with limited vaccines available, how um, how likely it is that it or it, it's unfair to to throw this at you right now. I know, but any sense of how many of our teachers who want to uh, are going to be able to be fully vaccinated uh, at, in a reasonable time? Uh, you know, I, I'm already starting to see that appointment times are filling up or that they're they're not even taking them until Monday. Uh, it's frustrating, I think, for teachers too, um, because they, they most of them want this and are more than willing to do whatever it takes to get it. But, you know, what, what can they do if there's a limited supply? Well, a couple things. First, it's a personal decision. Not everyone wants the vaccine. Right. Everyone has a different history in their background and, and different dynamics. Second of all, our goal as the school district is to get the information to our teachers as soon as it becomes available so they can sign up. And we were very fortunate to be able to do that yesterday. Also keep in mind that if you're getting the Pfizer vaccine, you're looking at about a 21 day window between shots. When the Moderna vaccine rolls out, you're looking at about a 28 day um, time period between shots. Now, there's some debate and we couldn't get a straight answer today about the efficacy like, okay, well, what if it's 19 days between? Is that okay? What if it's 22 days between? Is that okay? There's a lot of uncertainty about it, but understand our commitment is to get that information to our staff. Our staff loves teaching in person. They just want to be safe. That's not an unrealistic expectation. Our students love being in person, right? We just have to figure out the safest way to do it, and we are committed to doing that. And we'll continue to work to make sure our staff knows when the vaccines are available. And if they are at CVS and Walgreens, which is potentially part of the plan, we'll figure out that. If we know that there are going to be local doctor's offices or things like that, we all know someone we can reach out to and ask for some help to make sure the opportunity is there for our teachers. And we're working closely with the BHEA Right, so we don't work in isolation and not include the BHEA in our conversation. And when we have those conversations, it's the teachers that love to teach in person. They just want to be safe. That's it. All right, and, and they're going to get um, time to come back to their classrooms so they can set up and get organized before students arrive. Yeah. So we're working on plans for what that will take. I uh, don't know how many teachers that when we move distance, left their classroom setups and things like that. It should be a much easier transition because you know what it looks like, you know what it feels like, you've done it, right? So that that makes it a lot easier. You know, for me personally, as someone that spent 20 years in the classroom, it, it almost 20 years, it's a little easier adjustment once you've been through it after your first rodeo. But it is going to be a difficult transition. It's going to be a difficult transition for our students and for our staff. I, I really feel like some people don't really understand what a big transition this is when you move a whole organization of 5,500 students and employees from one model to the next and the amount of work, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but the amount of work and time it takes. We've asked our staff over and over again. I've asked Phil as a union president, Phil, can you do this, can you do this? Our teachers have stepped up over and over and over and did everything we have asked them to do. They will do a good job when we come back. They've done a great job before. Our students, when they come back, those who want to come back in the building, they'll follow the rules, they'll follow the protocols, they'll do a great job. We have a great group as a community within a school. Yep, Pat, uh, I, I'm gonna say this at every meeting, I know I sound like a broken record, but thank you. Thank you to Phil and to all of our teachers. Uh, really proud of the collaboration and the great relationship because they have gone well above and beyond uh, some of the stories I hear, family members that are teachers, I'm so thankful for our teachers and for all above and beyond, way, 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 way above and beyond that they've gone and, and all our staff. So, um, you know, maybe you can also pass that on again, just 
uh, more gratitude. Two kids in high school and honestly um, could not be more thankful for the work of our teachers and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. Uh, Jennifer? Um, well, ditto to all of that. Um, I have two high school students, one of whom has adapted to remote learning very well. The other one, not so much. Um, so all, all of these hardships um, and all of the grace that the teachers are showing right now um, to struggling students is, is just incredibly moving. So thank you to everybody in the organization. I, I just have one, I mean, it, it's not a secret. I'm a big proponent of the kids and teachers and getting back as soon and as safely as possible. Um, I have really just one pointed question, um, and, and I guess I'm taking advantage of my position on the stage here because I, I am a robotics parent, and there is some, I, I would just ask Pat that you speak with that, the leadership there tonight or tomorrow because there is some urgency with their situation. Um, and, you know, they not, not only compete in state championships, they compete and win in world championships. So their, their kickoff is this Saturday. Um, and they are looking for guidance as to how they may be allowed to proceed with that. So I, I would just request that you um, get in touch with them, please. Sounds good, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Howard? Thank you. Um, David, could you go back to the leading indicators slide, please? Okay, give me a second. Sure. Trustee Barron, did you say leading indicator slide? I'm gonna pull up my stuff as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's it, okay. So, which of those columns right now, based on the data, are we in? Right now, we're in the middle. Okay. And the middle column is telling us that we need to, or that we will be going to this hybrid, back to the hybrid model that we had in November, correct? No. no. This column is telling us we need to reassess strategies to determine appropriate balance of in-person and distance learning. Okay. My recommendation is to go back to the hybrid model. Very good. Okay, so where I was going earlier in my questioning is, so we're in the middle column right now, and if next week the data has us going to the right-hand column, and the, the data is coming from the community, from the Oakland County Health Department. Correct. Which is not you know unique to our buildings, like a an outbreak or something like that, or, or you know, kids going into quarantine specifically, but if we go plus 25 cases or over 10%, yes, what, hap what happens? What is, what Nothing. does, what, what Nothing. occurs? Nothing? Nothing? Nothing, because we're already in our less in-person learning model. The no, there's, there's a more or less in-person model, which is, you know, so if we go to 10%, but if we go to 15% or 20%, you know, are, are, we're not gonna do anything as a district unless unless we're demanded to do it by the, 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 the county or by the governor? We are yeah. coming back to the less in-person learning model. The reason we had it set up before to shut schools at 25 or 10 was based on Dr. Ja and the Harvard model that was put out this summer. That's why we adopted that as a school district. We changed those metrics based on best practices. We back up. Earlier during COVID, when Governor Whitmer shut down Michigan, she shut down everything. The second time around, it was strategic, right? Why? Because the data and science says you shut, you don't shut everything, you make targeted restrictions. That's what you do. Okay. So the Harvard model that we approved shutting schools at 25 and 10 percent that doesn't exist anymore 
That is not the recommendation of that team anymore. Their recommendation is you can still remain open, but you need to make sure you have your mitigation factors and there's other things. You need to make sure there's trust. You need to make sure that you have an updated HVAC um, and things like that. So we are coming back to the lesson person learning model. I, this I, gets back to President Coleman's question is, well, what is the next model look, gonna look no, like? David, please leave that slide up on the slide. Uh, that slide up, please, David. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave that up there. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that up there. Go on, Mr. Superintendent. Oh. So that's the model I'm proposing we come back under. Okay, so what I'm trying to understand is we we adopted this slide and the and the next and the other slide which is uh, secondary indicators. Mm -hmm. So we're currently in the in the center column, and if the data says we're in the right hand column, you're saying we're not going to do anything. Correct, because we are bringing back our model. We're bringing back is the least in-person model that is available. So what is it? So, so what six feet of social distancing, that is all the mitigation factors put in place. That's the A and B, uh, oh, sorry, that's the half days K through eight, so they're not eating lunch in a building. But that what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand, sir, is yeah. what is this chart that we approved? What does it mean if we move from one column to another and it says we go to less in-person learning, but you're saying that we won't do anything if that if the data goes up that we don't do anything. I don't understand then why we even have this chart in the first place. Well, let me, let me give you a different scenario, Trustee Barron. Let's say the data was less than 10 cases per 100,000 and less than 3%. And let's say we were bringing everyone back with no social distancing. That is the more in person. That's everyone back, right? Let's say we were doing that. And then we move towards the middle. Reassess strategies to determine appropriate balance of in-person remote learning. That might look like a different model. But based on where we left off and based on the best way to bring our students back as safely and our staff as quickly as possible, that is going with the less in-person learning model. So we're applying something, although if we had this set up before the school year started, it might look a little bit different because we adopted it based on where we were at, shut down, we're coming back in a less in-person learning model. So what I'm trying to understand, and this is getting so confusing here, is are you saying then that no matter where we are on the right hand side of that chart that the total total shutdown of a building is no longer best practice and therefore no matter where we are on the right hand side of that graph we will never go to a total shutdown of a building unless dictated to do that by the governor is that what i'm understanding no sir not dictated by the governor. We will work in collaboration with the Oakland County or, or, Oakland, or Oakland County Health, but we, that unless, is correct. That unless, is correct. Told, unless told by an outside organization, whether it's Dr. Caldoun or the governor, of Oakland County Health, but we as a district will not shut down a building. No well, matter what the data says, we should be. No matter where the data is on this chart, now, hold on, we will hold never on, shut down a building. Let, let's talk some more in hypotheticals. If you're telling me we're over 25 cases per 100,000, and yes. it's, it's 1,500, and that our percent positive is 72%, I mean, there's no absolutes to anything. I mean, come on now. But what, I'm, what, I'm, trying to, but what I'm trying to get at is I'm, I'm a data-driven guy, and I go by what's in the piece of paper that I approve, which is this. Got it. The, the, yeah, but how are you? I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure. I mean, I have no problem going with, because we're in the center column. I will agree with where we are and you, your plan that you're proposing, I will vote yes. But what I'm concerned about is, I mean, if the fact, I mean, I, exactly, I hope it's glasses half full. 
and that the vaccines and everything will bring us to the left. But I'm concerned that if we go to the right, that if we don't do anything and that we only do something if dictated to by an outside organization, I mean, that's an if come. I don't know. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But if it does, I, that concerns me. That's all. Because that's not what that says. I understand. Trustee Bear, keep this in mind. At the end of the day, the board can vote to move the whole district to remote learning at any time. But we go, we're going to do that on your recommendation, sir. We're not going to do that on our own. At least I don't want to. I want to do it on your recommendation. Then but I'm going to rely this chart that you gave us. We we'll understand. I will continue to rely on the science, the data, and best practices that we see on a national and international level. If the numbers continue to rise to a point where experts are telling us it's not safe, then we'll have a different conversation. Let me give you an example. Before we went on winter break, the Wayne County Health Division gave a strong recommendation that all schools should move to distance learning because of how high the numbers were, right? That's something that came out. I can't answer today what tomorrow's going to look like. I can answer what today looks like. And today it looks like it's time for our students to go back to in-person learning. Today, it looks like we need to continue continue to support our staff. We continue to do things that other districts won't even ask them to do. I talked to a superintendent probably four months ago in Ohio about concurrent learning, what the high school is doing, where you're you're streaming, you know, letting the kids remote in and have them in the building. His district went on strike over that. Our teachers were the first to step up in Oakland County and say, we have no idea what this is going to look like or how it's going to work or even if it's going to work or even if it's a good practice but we know our students want to keep their schedule. So we'll figure it out. We'll do our best. Nobody else wanted to do that. Now people can come along after and said, oh, this district and that district, and that's great. But our teachers were the first to do it. And Matt McLeod came to the meeting and said, as the union vice president, we just really love our students. We just want to support them. Same with the elementary staff. The things they're doing are unbelievable. This is not ideal. There is no ideal answer. I can't give you an answer to every single thing that's going to make the most sense right now. What I can promise you, promise you is I'll continue to do research. I'll continue to talk to as many people as I can. The team continues to bring information and research to the table every time we meet. COVID is part of something we talk about every single day. And our, our, our the team, when I say the team, every staff member in Bloomfield Hill Schools is passionate about doing this right being safe and supporting our students. That's fine. I know, I know you're data driven and I wish I could give you a simple answer, but there is no simple answer. And so, it's frustrating to me too. So to cut to, 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 so we can move on to the next person. I am fine with going with the recommendation you've got right now, because we're in the middle column. But if the data, which hopefully it doesn't, but if the data starts driving to the right hand column, I'm going to be wanting to hear your recommendations uh, of what we want to do and why we want to do it or not do it, because that's concerning me. I'm mostly concerned about the health of students. And if we are going into that right-hand column, that gives me a lot of angst. So thank you well, very much. Trustee Barron, I, I just, I, I wanna kind of correct you on your statement, because I've talked to you personally a lot of times. I know you're concerned about staff and students as well. Oh, I, I, oh no, oh, I know. And absolutely. I don't absolutely. Every, that wrong no, way no, every, every, everyone, everyone in the building. Everyone in the bill. Health, right, health, right. To me, health is, to me, and I know that this might be controversial, to me, health is more important than education. You can always get educated, but if you die or if you get seriously ill, it's for, the, for your entire life. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Baird. Thanks, Howard. Shiva? So, Superintendent Watson, thank you, Paul. Um, Superintendent Watson, um, so I'm trying, I'm following up on Howard's question. I'm trying to look at the two bookends. In the event that the board decides uh, to proceed and support your recommendation to go back to a hybrid model, mm -hmm. I'm asking two questions. One, what would cause the district to want to go to full time from a hybrid model as one bookend? And what would cause the district to go back to virtual again as the other bookend? Okay. So 
When you say full return, that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, we have another hybrid model that is out there that is five days a week where our specials K through eight are done remotely, um, but it's five days a week and it's a delayed start. Um, again, I can't speak in absolute, so what, what will cause us or what is uh, the number? What's the magic number? It's kind of thinking like retirement. You go see a financial planner. What do I need to save to retire so I never run out of money and I can live happily ever after? I kind of see it like that. There is no magic number. What we do want to see is the numbers to continue to go down. What we do want to see is the opportunity for our staff members to get vaccinated and have that. I think as each week goes on, I'll have more and more information about the vaccine and how things are going, but I can't answer that right now. What would cause us to go back to remote learning or distance learning, I believe was your other questions. If we can't staff a building, we'd have to go back. If we're seeing spread in the building, we'll either have to shut that classroom down, which we had happen before we went back to distance learning before, or we'll have to shut that building down. Our goal is to mitigate COVID as best as possible. And we don't wanna see spread in the building. That's when it's concerning. The data currently shows on the national level that if you have the proper mitigation factors, that COVID is not spread in your school buildings at the same rate it is when it comes to being out in your general population. Thank you. And for, for you, Trustee Kumar and Trustee Southward and Trustee John, I know this is a tough first board meeting to be in. Like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> the firing line, so to speak. Please ask okay, any you questions. You need to come to our first board meeting. <laughs> ask as many questions as you want, as many details. If you have questions after the meeting, that's great. Also, please keep in mind, we have another board meeting a week from tonight before we phase our students back in, if approved as well. So just kind of keep that in mind. Thanks. Does thank you, Superintendent. No, thank you, Paul. Okay, Michelle. Thank you, Pat. Um, so I, I hate to um, go back to the leading indicator slide. Yeah, let's go back. <laughs> but I, ha I do. I, I, this was my question, and I, and I know that it's like I, I wanted to know because as we're talking about pivoting, um, or possible, possibly having to pivot, uh, what happens in the case where you are in a mixed um, color zone with one and two? So what if you are at maybe ten? You know, ten new cases, you know, per day, but your um, your average is in the in the center section. So, what's most important is indi indicator number one or indicator number two that requires us to pivot. So, I'm trying to understand if it's not. Will it always be that you will be more in person? Will it always be this factor, or will there be a time where you could be at ten percent uh, on the seven day average and be at a, a ten to twenty percent less? cases per 10,000. So I'm trying to figure out which of the categories would have us pivot faster or, or, or not. Right, so we're really looking at it from a multifactorial approach. So there's not one factor that's more important than the other. And I think that really threw, you know, some people off early in the year as we were trying to figure this out. In fact, I think you're gonna see something very soon that's really interesting that's going to provide some clarity around some of the factors and things like that that's going to be um, done shortly. So there, there is no real answer to that question. Um, keep in mind, if this is approved tonight, any other changes to the schedule has to be brought to the board, shared, and then voted on again. There is no like, well, if we're at, we take it down. if the percent positive is 1%, but the case rate is 45, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Don't know what that means. There, there's no, I mean, with COVID, the devil's in the details. We're gonna continue to operate the best way we know possible. And, and I think, I hope you feel comfortable knowing that we're going to continue to bring everything to the table and that you're going to have the opportunity to view it and see it 
before any change is made to any other schedule if this gets approved. Nothing will change without board approval. I'm sorry it doesn't really answer your question, but I, I don't feel there is, I mean, it's all these what ifs, right? And if this happens, this, and we're going to do this, don't really have an answer for that. Michelle, do you have another question or comment? Uh, no, I just wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to publicly thank, you know, uh, the teachers definitely to the IT team, um, which, you know, having to pivot uh, into a complete remote um, segment definitely takes a lot of, of, of um, individuals working together. And so I definitely want to thank all the staff and administrators that have been working to put this plan together today for us to make a decision with as much information as possible. I think it's important for us to be able to understand um, what decisions were being made on data, but it's also a little bit more than just about the data. It's also about, you know, the people that think that was brought up earlier today, the health of the individuals. And so um, I think all the staff for all that you've done to help us be able to possibly bring our, our students back to, to classroom learning at a, at a, a phased in approach. So thank you. And Trustee Southward, Thanks just so you know, and the new board members know, we look at COVID at data you. every day multiple times a day and we're looking for the trends so you know also our district website updates the trends every day as well so as trustee baron said percent positive it started going back up a little bit and talking to a couple of epidemiologists they're not sure if that's an indicator or if it's just static right now we'll know more a week from now if that trend continues to go up same with the case rate is that trend going to continue to go up we'll know more um, because they'll be further out from uh, Christmas and from New Year's Day for those people that may have gathered and celebrated with other people. Now, I love to hear both sides of the, of the parent view that comes into you too. So if there's some things that we're hearing that we're not getting, being able to hear from how you know individuals are feeling, uh, I, I love to um, have that information to you about the move back to in person. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, John. Good evening, Pat, uh, uh, Superintendent Watson. Um, actually, the last thing you said uh, touches on what my question was going to be. Um, the two high schools going back after the semester makes sense. Um, there's already plans in place for the uh, exams and whatnot, as you indicated. Um, if the board is to vote to go back, uh, tonight, and we've got the elementary school going back on the 19th, and and the middle schools, um, and the reason for that is we're waiting to see what happens, but there's not going to be any change. I guess my question is uh, either why are we waiting, and two, uh, if that's not the reason, what is the reason for waiting? Um, if the numbers go up, is, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of confused as to if the numbers go up and we're going to make a different choice, um, and that's the reason why we're waiting, um, why is that? And if the numbers go up and we're not going to do anything differently, then why are we waiting? I apologize. I didn't explain that well then. Um, I don't expect to make a different recommendation next week unless something out of the blue comes up where the numbers just explode higher than we ever expected. Again, deal with what ifs. So why the 19th as opposed to maybe the 25th? I'm not sure if that's your no. question. Um, I guess my question is, it sounds like we're waiting to see what happens from Christmas and New Year's and gatherings and traveling and whatnot. Um, yeah, but that won't impact, that won't impact right. the decision. We're waiting because we know that there's a potential spike. So we want to continue to monitor that. I don't think it's going to change the return on the 19th. Okay. I'm satisfied. I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm making sense. We also, no. want, to we also want to stagger it a little bit. So today's the seventh. The 19th is in 12 days. If we have teachers at home that need daycare, they have 12 days to find daycare. If I sat here tonight and said, all right, how about Monday? Oh boy, how are we gonna get transportation to make sure we're good? 
how much additional do we need additional food that we need to order how am i going to get daycare we told our community earlier we would try to provide as much as possible a two-week transition period so this is cutting it down by a couple of days so we need people again that that's one part the other part is if i'm a parent at home my kids are ready to go back two months ago right <laughs> So we have the needs of our students, the needs of our staff, the needs of our parents. They don't always align like a typical school year would be. Um, so my recommendation is the 19th to give people time to make the decisions and get daycare, do the things they need to do. And also for us to allow our buildings to fully ramp up. They've been doing it all along, but again, you're preparing for what you don't know is going to happen or not happen. If approved tonight, they know, okay, the 19th, we've got to be ready to go. We've got to make sure we do all the things that we have on our checklist to be ready to go. Thank you. That uh, The last portion perfectly answered my question. All right, I'm sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, thanks, John. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul, our uh, student intern. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, so actually I have, I have two questions and uh, these have come out pretty much out of my interactions with students and also the board advisory council and also myself as a student who was in hybrid learning in the fall and virtual learning recently. So in, in the fall, there were some concerns about variations in classrooms when it comes to uh, cleaning procedures and uh, procedures for contact tracing. So as we move back into hybrid learning, uh, how will we communicate new policy changes to students and ensure that they're kind of being more uniformly observed to avoid any of the variations that uh, we saw a few months ago that could potentially be uh, safety concerns. So Leonard and, and, and Deb, so our director um, of health and wellness and our school nurse have met with all the administrative teams and walked the buildings and went through best practices and reminded them of everything that needs to happen. They're also meeting next week with all the building paraprofessionals or secretaries that need a reminder in the training as well. I think the best thing for you to do, Paul, for all students to do, if you see something that's not right, speak out. Let an administrator know, let a teacher know, hey, just so you know, this occurred today. Because for those who wanna be back in school, they wanna be back, right? And we wanna make sure that safe so they can be back, so they can enjoy that aspect of school. And it's not the school we left before this happened. Wearing a mask and speaking, because you're a high school student at the high school level, wearing a mask in the building, having some people in, some people out, on the computer, doing this, that's not what you left, right? You're still not getting that full experience that you had before. But there is some social contact you can have. There's some familiarity with going into the building. I know in the fall, when there were some events and going on before we went back to the person, kids were pulling me to the side saying, I'll follow whatever rule, I don't even care anymore. Just let me go back in the building, right? But we need to be safe. So please share that with the high school administrative team. If you don't feel comfortable sharing it with them, share it with any adult you trust. But I know Mr. Hollerith and his team take it very seriously. When we were in person and I was going by the high school, there were so many times I saw Mr. Hollerith by the bathroom. And the first time I asked him, what are you doing? He's like, I make sure only so many, so many students go in the bathroom at once. I'm like, oh my gosh, the job of the high school principal is to monitor the bathroom for a large portion of the day to make sure we don't have X amount of kids going in. So I know the adults are taking it seriously. I, I know they want. And again, you're right. We might have some students that don't follow the rules. And, and then if we don't know, we can't address it. And when we do know, we will address it. Uh, thank you. And my second one was more about kind of like uh, the variations in, in learning experience. So if a majority of students do choose to uh, uh, participate in the hybrid learning plan and there has been much interest for it, how can we ensure that students who choose to learn fully virtually uh, don't fall behind or have a lesser learning experience as opposed to their in-person or hybrid counterpart? So my answer to that is it's going to be a work in progress. We're asking teachers to teach, there's a name for it now, again, walking on at the high school level because you're asking as a high school student, right? The only reason I'm addressing as a high school level, to teach concurrently, to teach in person online. No one's received training, I'm not trying to make an excuse, I'm just stating the facts as they are. 
And it's, it's nerve wracking. My son's a student teacher this year and he's only been doing it online and talking to him and what he's tried to do. I said, well, imagine you're doing it online in the classroom. He's like, how's that even possible? We didn't talk about that in college. Like that's not even a real thing. So our teachers are putting in the work. They'll continue to grow and learn, but it's going to take additional time because they've never done it before. It is brand new. Um, Again, I'm proud of the teachers for being willing to try something so experimental and put themselves out there. You're on camera. I mean, that is nerve wracking. What is what the number one fear of most people? Public speaking. In the classroom, you're kind of sheltered. It's just me and my class, and we can talk about what we're going to talk about. Now, it might be recorded by someone else. Are they putting me on Snapchat? Are they making me a meme? Do they have their whole family watching in the background? It's a lot of stress on our teachers to do this. And then they're trying to figure out, is this working? Is it not working? I don't know. I'm not getting a lot of feedback from students, or I'm getting this feedback. You talk to another teacher. Well, this works for me. Well, I didn't even think about that. So I know maybe not the answer students want to hear. I, I think the big win out of this is that students were able to keep their schedule. Students all have all Bloomfield Hills High School teachers. We have some of the best teachers in the country. So I think that's the big win, and teachers will continue to grow and learn. They can't work any harder than they're working. I'm telling you that right now. They're putting in around-the-clock effort to make the best learning available for all of our students. Thank you. Any other questions, Paul? I, I have a question. I, I just want to make sure I understood Paul's second question. Um, Paul, are you asking about uh, when high school students go back, uh, you know, assuming on February 1st, how we are going to ensure that those who elect to stay home um, and, and participate virtually are getting the same kind of educational experience as those who elect to go in person. Uh, it, it, so I, I got that part of it. it and I'm wondering if it has to do with um, maybe the hours being shorter, um, for the all virtual classes so that students at home might be logging off with the teacher's blessing and her permission to work on homework or to work collaboratively or to ask questions of the teacher. And will those students who maybe are clocking in less time be getting the same education as those who are reporting to face-to-face? -to -face? Is that kind of the gist of the question? Right, it, it was pretty much because, uh, well, in a hybrid learning model, there's a, a teacher that has to divide their attention between a, an in-person and, and a virtual class and just ensure that uh, those who choose to stay home for whatever reason aren't uh, falling behind those that are in the hybrid plan and are receiving the same or as close as possible to, to an educational uh, experience of the same caliber. Yeah, that okay. is the goal. Definitely yeah, but the goal. Is still, Pat, am I right, though? I'm under the impression it's still the same class, it's still the same teacher. Correct. It okay. is. So, so what they're getting in person are things that we can't necessarily see because of, um, I, I don't know, students at home logged off for, you know. Well, so remember, different, students, different students have different needs, right? So there might be a student that, you know, is taking algebra two and it's really easy and is able to multitask and do a few different things. And compared to, you know, for me, math was my kryptonite. I could have spent four years in algebra two before I figured everything out. And that's okay. The teachers are going to try to meet the students where they are. And they're also trying to look at the curriculum and say, what is really important? What do the students really need to know? We can't have the same depth we've always had. We don't have the same amount of time. The pan like we're living historical events like we've never seen in my lifetime. Now, I remember when the Challenger exploded. I remember 9-11. I taught about the pandemic, but what we've seen in the past couple of days, what we've seen with the pandemic, the teachers are really trying to pare down what does the student really need to know to be successful? And then going from there. Yeah, and, and Paul, um, th that's really an excellent point you're bringing up and one I hadn't even thought of. Once we go back to a hybrid model, even though it's the same class and the same teacher 
and it's uh, simultaneous, they're still not necessarily getting the same experience. And what is that? How, how does that differ? And what does it look like for in-person students and at home? So, uh, I, I mean, can you report back to us once that have, I, I'm fascinated by the, the potential differences between the experiences. In my mind, it's the same. But I know that that's not exactly right. Um, things happen when a camera's off or, or when the camera's not, whatever it is, um, th there are benefits to being face to face that e even if you are in the same place, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great, great point. I, had, I really hadn't even thought of it. Thank you. We will uh, report back, I'm sure, as we move into the plan, the Board Advisory Council and I will meet and we'll work to, to uh, send out surveys to the students and, and track that and, and just to ensure that uh, pr pretty much it, it lies in teacher accessibility. Many students have said that obviously teachers are more, it's the same teacher, but the teacher is more accessible in the classroom and uh, potentially there's more motivation to participate than when maybe, you know, you're not being held uh, to participation but we will definitely look at that and report on that as we move back into this plan. Thank you. Pat, I just have one follow-up question. Um, you know, and I know we've been focusing tonight with, on, you know, on returning in person. Uh, just confirm that Bloomfield Virtual for the time being, you know, that that's not changing for the K through five. That's, you know, that that's going to be happening throughout the end of the year. Oh my gosh. Necessary. Yes, no, no. yes. And if and if necessary, going into the fall, if you know wherever vaccines are, and you know obviously the um, younger students, you know that's not coming out anytime soon. I don't know if you'd be able to comment now or just to think about, you know, as we, as we go into the fall 2021. Here's here's what I can say: We promised Bloomfield Virtual for the school year. There is no ands, ifs, or buts about whether or not it will continue. It will continue. What is it going to look like, or are we going to have it in the fall? It's not an answer I have right now. Obviously, when we're at that point, I'll bring a recommendation to the board with the why, whatever that decision is. We'll discuss it, and then we'll kind of move forward. Right now, that's kind of down the road. We're also, you know, our LST team is also working with building administrators about what can we do during the summer for our students and what the fall might look like as well from a mental health perspective and from an instructional perspective. There's a lot of work to be done, but the focus is on the task at hand. And the task at hand is to get our students and staff back into the buildings in a safe environment. Yep, no, that, that's good. Thanks, Pat. I know it's on the mind of some of our community members. Any other um, comments or questions before we go to public comment? No, uh, thank you, uh, President. I don't. I don't think I got a turn on this round. Am, am I wrong about that? Um, I, I just wanted to quickly comment to to Howard and Siva. This is, you know, I used to teach veterinary school, and I told my students, if you don't like being in the gray zone, you, you got to walk out right now, um, because that's all biology, all medicine. You know, biology is is the science for the dumb kids because we're not we're not smart enough to do chemistry, physics, or or advanced mathematics. But this is where it becomes very interesting if it if it wasn't linked to death, of course, um, and very very interesting because there are no absolutes. There are no you can't treat the piece of paper. You have to treat the patient. Okay. So the, everything about this is going to drive is it can and will drive everybody nuts. And obviously the stakes are, are very high and, and everybody has been under stress. But I want to say we have a superintendent who basically has earned a, a master's in, in biology at this point. Um, I am I am humbled and astonished um, by how much reading and research you do and you have led us to do all of the right things. Um, so I just wanted the community to know that. I I have three postgraduate degrees in science and you know I, I don't have time to sit around reading every COVID paper, but but Pat pretty much is. Um, so 
uh, my, my hat is really off to you. So, you know, and when, so when you look at that paper of leading indicators, you know, first of all, we have to start with what is a case, right? Th those are both looking at cases, okay? A case is a positive test, whether you're sick or well, um, and a case is counted, I believe, by the county as a sick person with very classic COVID signs who doesn't have a documented positive test. Okay, so that's a case, but but what are we really talking about here? Our, our goal is to avoid death. So are we talking about what are the hospitalizations? What are the ventilators? And what are the deaths? You know, when I think about cases, I, I that's what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about the fraction who are home in bed for a few days um, feeling poorly. And, you know, not that that's a walk in the park, but you know, that is what the goal is, you know, um, is to turn a fatal disease into a few days in bed. But though both of those, if you look at a piece of paper, both of those are cases, you know, so you have to really look at the disease entity organically um, from top to bottom and, and ask yourself, what are we really trying to do here? Um, and if we're not dealing with causing an outbreak, which our lived experience tells us we're not, um, and if we're not dealing with, God forbid, you know, death of community members, um, we have to stand by our duty as educators and, and have the kids in school. You know, so we, that, that leading indicator paper just makes me nuts today because we have, we have the lagging indicators, we have all the hospitalization and mortality data, we have our own lived experience, and we have now we have the vaccine, um, hopefully a lot more, thank God, very, very soon. So and our knowledge, I mean, you think things have been changing now. I, I predict that things are going to change very rapidly in terms of what is what is a quarantine, when is it necessary? All of that stuff is going to start to go way into flux um, when we when we start seeing um, data of vaccinated um, individuals. So that's all I wanted to say, Howard, that uh, I hear your frustration and Siva, but, but that's, that's the nature um, of the beast. Um, and I, and we, are, we are in very, very good hands. And I've been very impressed, uh, although slow on the uptake, the, the people at Oakland County Health Division, they, they're good people, they know their stuff. Um, I've been in these meetings now for a few months and um, they are they are really on top of things, and so they they are trying to get as many doses as as quickly as possible. I, I'm going to echo that about Oakland County Health Department. Also, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I've been a really harsh critic of them, and uh, especially lately, same thing. Really impressed. Thanks for yeah, bringing that up too. I like the opportunity to be able to say that uh, publicly too, because same same thing. Yeah, they're public health officials and they're epidemiologists. They they totally know what they're doing. So um, I, I'm very, <laughs> yesterday was a crazy day, right? To have vaccines, the Senate and the mob in the Capitol all at the same day. I was like, I, I can't. I can't do this in one day. <laughs> Can we spread this out over several days? No, but it, this is what I envisioned uh, at, at the beginning, that we would pool resources, um, kind of like Pat has done from day one, uh, although he's had to make his own task forces, you know, going to even as far as different countries to put together um, collaborative and research forces. Uh, and I really had hoped we would get there at home. And we're taking giant steps toward that. Oakland County has been really collaborative and really useful to board members um, and to the community. So, you know. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Another, another thing is we were on a call with uh, most of the school boards in the county last night. There's not a single, I mean, I, a couple of them didn't have any answer because they hadn't had their meeting yet. But I mean, I'm not a Joneses type of person, but pretty much all of the districts in the county are, are doing something similar to, to what we are. Couple actually in, in a lot more in person. And a couple have already emailed me to let me know when we get any new metrics so that they can follow whatever we're doing, so. Can I say one thing real quick, please? Yep, Pat. 
Trusty Cook, I appreciate the compliment, but I do want to clarify something, make something crystal clear to everyone watching and all the board members. The COVID research has been done by the whole district administrator team. Every single district administrator speaks COVID. I, you know, I can walk down to Todd's office and talk about anything with COVID. I can call Margaret. I can call Andy Giniak. Heck, I can call Mary Hillberry and say, "Block." Everyone speaks the language. Everyone knows. Everyone's pitched in and taken it on as literally a second job to the current job they have. So I really want to compliment every district administrator that is giving up time from their family and their friends and their social life to learn about COVID. And the joke I always make is, you know, I ducked out of AP Chem because, hey, I grew up in Ann Arbor and there's a lot of stuff to do downtown. I really wish I had stayed in the class and paid more attention. I didn't realize I was going to need it later in life. And so lesson learned. If you're a student, Paul, watching, you never know when you're going to need the class you're in and everything's really important. Don't make the mistake I did. Pay attention to everything. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. With that, we'll go to public Howard. Yeah, real, real quick. Um, so we are going to be getting so much better in the next few months because of vaccinations and because of the spring. You know, we're, we're coming out of COVID. My concern is purely, you know, the next few weeks to a month or so as the Christmas, you know, issues and the New Year's Day issues hit us. Now, Michigan has not has been doing so much better than the rest of the country. But you see the stories about what goes on in California and Florida and Texas and a lot of other areas of the country where they are just, you know, people are backing up like cordwood. Um, I, as long as we can get through the next month, I think, you know, we're, we're going to be cruising along and everything's going to be great. I, that's my only concern. So I, I hope, you know, uh, Jennifer, your lips to, uh, to God's ears. I hope everything comes out all right. But I'm just trying to be very, um, you know, looking at the, you know, being the doubting Thomas and uh, looking at, you know, the what ifs. Let's see how the numbers come out over the next uh, few weeks to a month. And hopefully everything is great and um, we don't have to worry about this going, you know, we, this whole thing will be in the rear view mirror. Thank you. And, well, you know, and, and, as, and as Pat and uh, everyone has said before, there's no letdown of caution, you know, at, at all, like in, in, until we have, a, we know a lot more about how, how well the vaccine is, is doing. Yep. So, you know, we, if we stick to all of our precautions, you know, we, we can I, we can only be and unless there's some you know crazy horrible thing happens in the, in our larger community we can only be in as good or better shape as we were in October when there were no outbreaks. If you look at other areas of the country, they can't say that at all. So we will anyway. Thank you. All right, um, Dave. Do we have um, public comment? We do, and we have a few, a handful of uh, call-ins. So they're in the yellow there at the top, and then Paul will try to go through these as best we possibly can. Okay, uh, Sarah Lipson, first person, public comment. Um, just so everyone knows, we do have a three-minute limit to public comment, and I will be keeping time. Hi, can you hear me? My Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, didn't realize I'd be going first. Um, so Zoom seems to be much more effective, overwritten comment, but it's definitely more nerve wracking. Um, I started taking notes when the meeting, the discussion started and I'm hopeful this won't be relevant and I'm hopeful. Um, first, thank you so much, Superintendent Watson. I think the effort that you've put in is just so evident. So thank you. Um, I am basically, with my public speaking fear, um, choosing to come on to beg you all to please vote yes on getting our kids back to school. Um, forget the previous drama, look at the data, listen to the parents, look at the, the trends and really think about our kids. Um, you know, not all I've heard from the board that you know, a lot of the high school students are thriving. Um, I know that they are not all thriving. 
Um, and I can tell you from a parent of a first grader, the K through five kids are especially not thriving. And, you know, some posts that I've seen on Facebook are, seem to be pretty insensitive to parents like me, um, whose children, some of our kids that are struggling are not protected by a 504 or an IEP, and they are still struggling. And quite frankly, it's disgraceful that it's, it's just really sad. Um, Trustee Barron, you had commented that your um, number one priority is the health of the students. And I know a lot of parents feel like our kids' mental health has been forgotten and left behind. Um, please don't forget about that. It is so crucial. Um, hold on. Um, for Wednesdays, if we can, in theory, increase time depending on a vaccination and numbers, um, I think most parents, including myself, are just also begging to, con to please be transparent with Wednesdays. Please don't forget that other schools, a lot of them are returning to five days and we're Bloomfield Hills and I'm, we can figure it out whether it's um, making changes if we stay four days or negotiating with the union or doing whatever it takes. But Wednesdays are not working and I think that the parents have voiced that loud and clear. Um, that with the struggling point, um, this is one style of learning and not every child can do it. And again, it's just we've gone here but we have the opportunity to make a change and um i i personally feel that any no vote at this point if this is not unanimous any no vote based on the data um should be viewed as a personal agenda like i i know a lot of parents feel like that we are at our wits ends and our kids are the ones that are suffering and sarah can you wrap up please yeah that's pretty much uh that's pretty much it. I just ask you and you vote to think about me and my son and his friends and the other parents who are not making public comments who need our kids back in school for their mental health. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Dave, uh, the next person who's here live. Yeah, might be, hang on one second. I can't see it on my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Rockhead? Uh, we just... Yeah, we're God. Regard. Yep. Thank you. Good evening. Our names are Regado Bashir and Isha Gumaraju, and we are freshmen at BHHS and IA respectively. We are here today representing the Student Equity Council in order to elaborate on the perspective of students regarding the hybrid design. We will be taking into account how COVID-19 disproportionately affects marginalized students, as well as the impact the hybrid model has on the social aspect of learning. The hybrid design itself creates problems that affect the entire school community, but disproportionately challenges marginalized students. Different systems can have disproportionate impacts on our most marginalized students, specifically our low income black and brown students. From a financial perspective, these student groups are less likely to have the appropriate resources to adapt to these drastic changes. Marginalized students are also faced with an increased risk of contracting COVID-19 and inability to afford medical expenses of contracted COVID-19 or specific mental health struggles originating from the switch from in-person to virtual learning, all of which discourage marginalized students from returning in person. Not only this, however, the extra strain of monitoring students over Zoom and in person prevents teachers from be being able to establish connections with all of their students. And Bloomfield's mm -hmm. previous attempt at using the hybrid model, students learning virtually remained isolated from their peers due to technical issues, which prevented virtual students from participating in classroom discussions. While in person students are able to talk with each other, ask for help during asynchronous time, Virtual students don't get to enjoy the same socialization. Disabled students particularly will suffer due to the switch to hybrid. Since the hybrid model was not created with them in mind and teachers will be overwhelmed with managing two classrooms at once, their accommodations may be inaccessible to them. Virtual students are given an incomplete learning experience compared to in-person students. Continuing all virtual learning allows the district to focus on perfecting virtual learning and eliminate some of the disparities caused by the hybrid model. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next, I think, is Michael, if I recall. 
Mike? Yep, I'm here. Sorry. Yeah, I see him here. Yep. Okay. Good evening, um, members of the school board. Uh, my name is Mike Bohura. I have uh, three kids um, in the district. Two of them are at uh, Bloomfield Hills Middle School. I mean, sorry, one at two of them at the middle school and one at Conant. And um, uh, I don't have a formal speech right now, but I would, you know, I. I felt like it was better to say it in person than to try to type something out. I'm a little even dumbfounded that we're we're not even voting for a full coming back to class. That you know, I guess we'll take hybrid, but I don't see the point. I don't see. I'm going to echo what Miss um, Lipson said. Anybody who doesn't vote yes at this point, I would question what your agenda is. I mean, these kids need to go back to school. I got my kids, at, you know, uh, that are really struggling. Um, with the virtual learning every day, all day at home, uh, they they don't get to have any social interaction with the kids their age. Um, they're I could tell their demeanor has changed. They're they're um, they're just not the same. And I'm as a father of three boys in that district, more than happy to take the chance that they might contract COVID, as opposed to what the long term ramifications of, uh, on their mental health and 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 not being around kids and not being in school. And so. You know, I've gotten to the point where if they're not going to get back to school, and I think I'm not alone, we have to start considering what other options we have. How is it that the private schools are are open? How is it that other districts are open? But Bloomfield Hills, we're still, you know, you're trying to overanalyze everything, trying to sift through all the data. They need to be back in school. And so I, I'm, I'm, I apologize if my tone is coming off as a little harsh, but enough's enough. Get them back in school. And start with hybrid if you have to, but they need to be back in school full time as soon as humanly possible. And, and I'm going to just finalize by saying the teachers are doing a wonderful job. I, I, I see it every day <clears throat> before I go to work. They're doing a great job. I can't imagine what they have to go through. And so this is, you know, the frustration is not at any of the the teachers or, you know, the 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 school, the principals. It's just you got to get past this. I mean, it is what it is. It's here. You're whether you're vaccinated or not. I mean, we're all going to have to deal with COVID at some point. But to shut down the schools and to keep keep the kids at home and, and have them you know, almost walking around depressed and I mean, it, you can't do it. You're sacrificing too much. So I urge you to get them back to school as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Dave, put up the rest of the public comment. I'll read them. Comes. Okay. Dear Paul, welcome back and happy new year. And thank you to the new board members for their willingness to serve. As the board administration continues to evaluate conditions to return to in-person education, urge all to be nimble with your fall plans. Things have changed rather quickly, particularly with vaccines. I wonder that your reliance and engagement with Oakland County officials may be. In these new circumstances, detrimental to kids, as you know, the state legislature abandoned school issues to volunteer board members like yourself and public and public health agencies can only provide so much assistance. Most Bloomfield families don't turn there under no, normal circumstances. And when it comes to something, say vaccines, we see glaring problems already. Senator Rosemary Bear tweeted out to constituents just today that they should not that they should not. Uh, contact Oakland County about vaccines. This restrains for a number of reasons, not at least of which is trying to control the speech of taxpayers and public agencies. But it makes sense if she was saying, in effect, they don't have any vaccines. They don't know where they're going to get them, and they don't know how to distribute them when we get them. It is bad then to rely on government agencies that we that are ill-equipped, and even worse, to rely on politicians willing to try to cover that. If the schools are relying on a county, and at and this level of well confidence, then we are all set to extend the nightmare of our children. I'm not ready to do that so a political party can protect itself. Please receive my skepticism with report or advice. We are now in new territory, and it's clear to me that the state and the county will do what they can, not to help families and kids protect the reputations of our elected officials charged with this responsibility. We've given enough. Thank you. We selected in we selected in person learning option for a reason. We want our children to attend in person. Families can select virtual learning if they are concerned about returning to in school in person. There is no reason for this board to continue to deny 
and in-person education those families who have opted for it. I urge you to return our children to their classrooms, peers, and teachers face-to-face. Welcome new board members. It is time to bring the children back to school, blindly following guidelines established early in the pandemic that rely on no longer current information is both lazy and irresponsible. Sadly, after robust discussions at the last meeting, the board fell back on these guidelines because it did not believe it had a choice after previously adopting the metrics and voted to keep the children out of the schools. Please do not repeat this mistake. I'm looking forward to you making the correct decision, providing the school children of our district the interaction with teachers and peers that is such a large part of the school experience they have been missing out for but too, for far too long. I sincerely hope that the board considers a return to in-person as soon as possible. The past month of social distancing has been very difficult for our third graders and the rest of our family. I wanna thank the board for the continued dedication to the safety of our children and our community throughout the pandemic. I appreciate the board's strong position to have a metric system that follows COVID cases in Oakland County and clearly outlines when we will be in face-to-face for distance learning. This has helped us as, as parents make decisions for our children for the second semester and it's a prudent thing to continue to follow. I would caution the board that allow the COVID numbers are currently decreasing. We have not seen all the effects and gatherings during the holiday seasons may have had. We are also we are also there in another more contagious strain of virus which will make its way to our area. Therefore, I urge the board to use the utmost caution and to continue to use the same metrics which include transitioning to distance learning if the COVID numbers increase to the red zone and not consider return to face-to-face learning until we're back in orange for at least 21 days. Thank you for your time and continued service to our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our concerns for all that you continue to do for our community. We, the elective staff of Bloomfield Hills Middle School, the elective staff of Bloomfield Hills Middle School want to take, want to make some requests for consideration we discussed in moving back into a hybrid schedule. We have witnessed the district make changes for the high school schedule and feel there are some improvements that can be made that will benefit both students and staff at the middle school level. We have already brought this up to the attention of union leadership and some BHS administration, and I wish to share it with you. We request that AB days remain static throughout the week. A days Monday slash Thursday, B days Tuesday slash Friday. We have seen over and over again that students continue to struggle with remaining in a routine that will, that when only some of their classes change each day. This is compounded the fact that the time students have have the class changes based on which day of the week is. We are spending more time tracking down students than we are teaching during our 20 minute Zooms. We request that Wednesdays be eight circuitous learning for all six to eight electives. We align with core teachers. We also need time to connect with individual students just as core teachers do. They also align with Black Box Hour that was currently added to the high school. Six to eight elective teachers currently have 12 Zoom classes a day with only five to 10 minutes to transition between grade level Zooms and little time available outside of class to work with 200 to 400 students. We also want to mention that we have concerns about switching to hybrid on the 19th. By returning to hybrid on the 19th, we lose six to eight grade students with only four day, days of class to adjust to a new elective schedule and complete missed assignments. The shift will create a huge disruption in the schedule that will burden elective teachers with additional obstacles and will try to hunt down students to get grades and assignments completed in before the end of the semester on July on January 29th. Starting six to eight and hybrid on February 1st with the high school give time to finish our semester in a consistent routine and consider our changes to the hybrid schedule as proposed above. As always, we're open to conversations and ideas. Please know that six to eight elective teachers feel like their current hybrid schedule is neither effective nor sustainable as we look to the remainder of the year. We look forward to following up to discuss these concerns. Anything else? Yep. When school remains virtual, I feel the need to revisit the topic of high school students having their cameras on during class. From what I understand, it was a district-wide decision to make this optional. However, at least some middle schools have made it mandatory. It is disrespectful to the teachers who have who have to communicate with dozens of faceless screens and through high schoolers may not completely recognize the benefits. It really is important that they see the peers' faces. Currently, most students keep the cameras off during class, while some students who want to be more present uh, don't because, let's face it, who wants to be that kid? Please reconsider making it mandatory for high school students. Dear Board of Education, thank you for your service and congratulations for those newly elected. Your time and dedication to the worthy cause of education is greatly appreciated. It is evident that the Board's excellent credentials and schooling experience that you truly honor the valued exceptional education. During your tenure, it is imperative that the board remain cognizant that your leadership, vision, direction is essential for the success of the entire educational Bloomfield Hills School District and future generations. It is the responsibility of our leaders that making good and hard decisions are sometimes not only most popular, especially in times of flux and upheaval. I am asking the board to choose what is in the best interest of our students' education to resume face-to-face learning so they have the opportunity to achieve academic excellence. 
These kids need interaction, socialization, opportunities to share the spirit of learning collectively in a schoolroom environment, which is designed for nurturing great thought, obtaining knowledge together, and challenging students' ability to succeed while providing a safe haven for mental wellness con con continuity and consistency. As parents, we understand there are staffing difficulties. Maybe the board can focus on overcoming these challenges instead of sacrificing the well-being of the students and their education. Please, again, we are urging the board to allow the students to go back to school. Again, thank you for your service. Let me start by welcoming the new board members and wishing you a happy and healthy new year. As I await another board meeting, I would like to address the students will be back in school. Many schools throughout the state have had plans in place for a while now. Birmingham returns 119, Farmington 125, West Bloomfield 119. Wall Lake is already back in school with 6 through 12 and returning 119, Northville 119, Troy 119, and many private schools are already back in school starting this week. When is Bloomfield going to step up and kids back in school? Well, I, well, I not know all students wish to return. Bluefield has made it possible for his virtual and in-class learning. So I asked since there, if can you move it up? Yep. Hang on. There you go. There you go. So I asked since there are options to keep all families satisfied while these kids are not in school. Our kids are suffering in, in, in irreparable harm. These kids are not failing, but academically, but their mental health is really suffering. Something needs to be done and needs to be done as soon as possible. Good evening. I have three children in the district in third, fifth, and eighth grade. These children wake up every morning and sit in front of the computers for the majority of the day. They complain of headaches, strained eyes, have gained weight, and feeling sad and angry and at times depressed. They are not the children we once knew. Virtual school is not working for them, and neither is a hybrid option that requires a child to navigate a full three to four hours alone without any teacher interaction. The children of many of our family and friends have been in school full time since September and are happy and thriving. We urge you to take the mental and physical health of the children in consideration. Allow them to please return to school full time. Please give up. Please give us an option and help get our children back on track. I urge the board to consider for returning person as soon as possible. The district is losing families to private schools. For many of these, will not return once the situation has improved. This will impact funding and performance in the long term. There's been multiple articles from experts citing the students should be in school, that the virus is not spreading in schools. We need to think about the long-term impacts of continuing to keep students virtually. There are several reasons to be uncomfortable. There are several reasons to be uncomfortable about the decision-making ability of BH for return in person learning. BHS should not rush back in person learning and they should need to publish a baseline fact-based set of metrics, goals, and adhere to the duration. This means accepting the scientific learning curve and staying with a more conservative plan. The data used in deciding return in personal learning comes from multiple searches, multiple sources, which have been conf conflicting key data points. The Harvard-Brown study, given a lot of weight in the board's decision-making, has revised its recommendation to suggest children can safely return to in-person learning at the highest levels of COVID spread than previously recommended. The revision is due to new scientific information, but also now includes certain additional criteria for school to meet. While the revision may drive BHS to expedite return in person learning, there are at least a couple of issues. BHS does not meet several of the new criteria to be considered safe. The study itself does not appear to publish any specific metrics or data to support the new recommendation. Conan Elementary reported at least one COVID case, but the summary numbers of the BHS website shows Conan have zero cases. All teachers will not be able to get vaccinated for the recommended return date. Again, there have been multiple glaring on factual statements made in past meetings. Time to move forward, statement made in the meeting, and the tone body language makes clear that BHS is impatient, impulsive, this is dangerous. I and other parents will seek to hold BHS responsible financially for health care bills and loss of employment if our children are affected with COVID-19 and can be proven spread and it can be proved proven spread in schools. You want to move it up. Um, I'm very sad and angry to hear that staff from Fox Hills are being used to substitute at other Bloomfield schools. Because of being in multiple buildings, many staff were forced to quarantine or contract with the virus became ill. The process is an exact opposite of using containment as a way to stop the spread. This actually helped create more of a spread of the virus by forcing teachers to go into different buildings on a day-to-day -day basis. When I can understand substitutes were needed, I feel we made the situation worse by having staff in multiple buildings. It made some staff feel very uncomfortable and some felt obligated to cover classrooms when they did not feel safe. This is unacceptable. I was, cur I was curious the plan the district has uh, to substitute coverage throughout the district so this does not happen again. <laughs> Regarding the potential resumption of in-person learning for BHS High School in January 2021, I request that the school board vote against the resumption prior to March 1 for the following reasons. We are in a period of national increased infections and hospitalizations. The increased rate of infection has pushed some regions in the U.S. beyond hospital capacities, and we are seeing rationing of care and resources. We should wait until there is clear evidence related to the expected post-December holiday bump in infections. We must plan for the new more highly infectious strain that has not yet hit Michigan. Teachers have not received vaccinations, so their safety cannot be, cannot be assured. Additionally, many students' hybrid 
instruction was much less effective than a wholesale focus on on virtual instructions. I would imagine that for teachers, hybrid instruction, which requires teaching both in-person students and at-home students, is more taxing, demanding than a singular focus on virtual instruction. Hybrid instruction creates an inherent uh, okay, teach it. Uh, hybrid instruction creates an inherent inequity where virtual students receive an inferior education experience compared to those attending in person. The waiting until March can hopefully bypass the risks associated with the post holiday infection wave, have clearly on the impact of newly highly infectious mutations, hopefully get some teachers vaccinated, and provide a consistent quality of education experience to the vast majority of students. If exceptions are made, they should focus on students with IEPs or 504s that would indicate significant benefits to in-person instruction for those students who have acute psychosocial emotional needs that can be addressed by in-person schooling. Thank you for your consideration. We appreciate the civil, intelligent, and thorough discussion demonstrated by the school board tonight. We have two elementary age kids that are very excited to go to school. They crave time with other kids. Of course, we want to do this safely. All this thoroughly worked through have done by Bloomfield Health Schools. The teacher administration thus far made us very safe as parents. We're looking forward to the next steps to returning to children in school. Thank you. Superintendent is making a lot of generalization blanket statements. When the statements are related to family lifestyles and preferences, that's one thing. However, generalized and somewhat superficial statements related to COVID trends and expert recommendations is dangerous. It must be clear the superintendent is letting personal opinion drive his recommendation. The recommendation should be driven by scientific fact. This must be a set of clear metric targets that we must follow the plan. Anything other than will create confusion, upset, and danger for families. If this process continues in this condition, there will be media exposure. It is, it is project management 101 to establish clear, measurable guidelines will follow them. I just want to thank Superintendent Pat Watson for clear direction and getting kids back to school safely. Thank you for seeing the need to help these kids safely, mentally, and physically. I want to, I want to thank the board, especially Paul Cohen, for being a great president and advocate for our students, parents, and teachers. All of our three, uh, go back. All of our, all of our daughters are struggling socially, emotionally, and academically. Lisa, you have to realize that earlier you misspoke. The governor has made it clear that K through eight is essential, and what was included in the Remain Open column in November. But BH did not have any options, so we really need to listen to the governor's recommendations and get our children back in school in person K through eight. As she's already stated, there must be open in person. End of the story. Fauci made the U.S. aware of the countless articles regarding how schools indeed are safe and not spreading there, spreading in person and um, safe and spreading there rather than at home. You must think about bringing back these Wednesdays as soon as possible, not four half days. Teachers can have prep time as children should be attending their specific specials in school, no longer online gym and aren't sitting at a kitchen table alone. We must have our board understanding your parents here. Howard, you're consistently telling us that you're so concerned about the health of students. It sounds that, that you're not thinking about or even taking into consideration the whole child. Rather than you personally believe and value a safe, it's completely uh, disregarding the thinking about or even taking the, uh, uh, the mental, social, and emotional health of our students in Bloomfield Hills Public Schools. You've stated many times you're a data person. Social, emotional health is a construct that cannot be put on a chart. It is obvious that you and other few board members are extremely out of touch with young children and have families in our district that have taken on your own personal opinions, values, and a blanket linear thought process. We can't keep doing this. Please turn your head and look into the real problems right now and real safety at all. Thank you for amazing staff board members, especially Paul Cullen, who has continued to fight for our children. The large majority of the community has graciously has great appreciation for you. We understand that teachers, daycare, teacher staff and daycare 12 days in a year compared to what were battled. Please know and understand that so many district parents, professional lives and jobs have been shattered and struggled, lost wages, lost our jobs, et cetera, because we have not had appropriate daycare for our young children at home and when we've been given a, a day or two or three notice that we must be home full time every day running a computer with five, six, seven, eight year olds. Again, it's completely different for those who have to leave their high school students at home and don't think about the younger middle schoolers and elementary students. We need to take the entire district into consideration, move on because the parochial and private schools are absolutely crushing us and they have been in a full time school all day, every day since August 24th. Let's get it together now, Bloomfield. Our children have not been in front of the full time structure since March of 2020. Almost a calendar year. This is frightening. I question why I question why the administration is not exploring on going a full day schedule for K through eight versus half days of live instruction as currently planned. Our districts nearby and nationwide have moved to a full day schedule for live instruction days for their schools, with no evidence that the implementation has led to any sort of increased risk of students or teachers versus a half day schedule. 
Additionally, for high school, question one, why do we need to start a couple of the weeks later than K through eight? The high school students' bodies have no interaction with K through eight, so there should be little justification for this delay. Hopefully, the school districts should be ready to start K through eight in high school on the same day. Finally, what steps are being taken to promote the gold standard for education? That being in-person live instruction is the best. In my experience with the children, their friends, the politics that were in place the fall semester were a failure. Teachers needed to teach students in school and virtually simultaneously led to several teaching everyone via Zoom, even as students in face-to-face -face school. Coupled with the complete freedom and students had to choose on any given day if they want to go to school face-to-face -face or stay at home. I quickly saw a large portion of the students choose to stay at home, not due to fears of COVID, but more for selfish reasons. They could not, they could sleep in more. Since, and since teachers were focused on teaching via Zoom, that would be, that they would get the same experience at home as they were in school and their friends were also staying at home, meaning that classes in school were basically empty. Is this a better policy that can be implemented? I assume that's it, Dave. That is it. Great job. Uh, thanks, Dave. With that, we'll go to board business. Uh, can I have a motion? I move the Board of Education approve the return to in-person instruction phase in dates as presented as follows. January 19th, 2021, for grades K-8, K-8 Blackhawk Care, grades preschool through 8 DHH, grades K-8 self-contained ARP, F -P -F -R -P. Bloomin' Preschool, early on, seed, Wing Lake Prep and Bowers Academy, January 25th, 2021, grades 9 through 12 IA, February 1st, 2021, grades 9, 12 BHHS, grades 9 through 12 DHH, and grades 9 through 12 self-contained ARP, FRP. Thank you. Do I have support? Support. I second. Okay. Uh, we have support uh, from SIVA. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Uh, let's vote. Uh, Howard? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Siva? Yes. How many yes? Motion passes 7-0. Uh, I'd like to call for adjournment.